What is connectivity in a screenplay and why is that important? I feel like that, to me at least, the connectivity seems like it would go with uh, like plot holes sort of thing, like filling it. Because uh, a lot of new writers, when they're writing stuff, aren't really looking at it as a whole. They're just doing like scene by scene by scene by scene by scene and not realizing when there are things that happen here that you never set up over here. So it kind of feels like it's out of left field. You know, like the, the, the the big thing is having like you know twist endings and stuff like that. Well, twist ending doesn't work if you didn't set it up in in advance. Uh, it'll just feel completely out of left field, you know. So, it to me at least that that's my understanding of from the question. It, you know, with that is is being able to connect the different aspects of the thing to make it make sense. Because if you don't have the setup, then the payoff doesn't work, you know. Or if you do a setup and then there's no payoff, well now you just ruin the perfectly good setup and people are going to be mad. Why didn't this come to fruition, you know. Right. Okay. So, so just like turn of events, different things. It can't just happen where there was nothing to right. set something off. Yeah. Like I said, the, the twist doesn't work if there's no no setup. If otherwise, it's just a twist for the sake of having a twist, and that never works well. Right. Do you think that it's best though that the audience didn't see the twist coming? I mean, in terms of audience likes to know something sure. but do they okay, totally so even even in a movie where there's like a twist that you never saw coming there's usually something in it that if you were to go rewind it and watch it again like then you'll see oh that was already set up in advance sort of thing you know right. um, i feel like in a movie if it's going forward and then the ending like is completely bizarro and had nothing to do with anything like i feel like i'm cheated that feels like a huge like deus ex machina sort of situation to me of like there's no way this would have happened. Why did this suddenly happen? You know, but if there's things that set up, I just read. So I, I I read through a lot of the like the blacklist scripts, and I just read one that was on 2019 blacklist, where the ending is kind of a twist ending, but it's something that that if you paid attention, got set up a few pages at least prior. So it wasn't like way at the beginning it got set up, but um, and like the twist ending in it, in it was that sh it, it's about a mountain climber who she's climbing up this mountain and it's like a haunted mountain. And, oh, right. and at the very end of it, I don't know if this is gonna be a spoiler because I don't, as far as I know, it hasn't got picked up anywhere yet. So in five years from now, it may be picked up and I apologize for spoiling it five years in advance. Um, <laughs> but she gets at the end, like as she's climbing, um, when she gets to the very tip top, it turns out that now she's like a part of like a heavenly sort of situation. And then it suddenly jumps to where find her dead body like in the cave below. Um, and it's kind of twisty because it's like all of a sudden, okay, she got the clock. What? She was dead, but it sets it up because there's a couple different times when she falls while climbing the mountain and like miraculously got saved, especially the very last one when she falls and one of the ghosts catch her. It was like at that point, okay, she's still plummeting <laughs> when, when he caught her, but it makes it look like, or um, what's the one with Mandy Moore in the sharks? Uh, oh, 47. Uh, 47 meters. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try that again. Right, right. So for 47 meters with Mandy Moore, you know, like the, and I apologize again for spoiling stuff, but at the end of the thing, you find out that like a lot of the, the rest of the, a lot of the end of the script like never happened. Like she gets saved and we find out that, oh, she's actually been imagining this whole thing the whole time about her having this final encounter with the shark, getting out of the cage, getting rescued, coming up on the ship. And they do it a really cool way. You know, she had gotten like injured along the way. And when she's on the ship, her blood is like floating in the air above her. And she's like watching it. And then it cuts down to her still being in the shark tank. And but they set that up it, because of the whole thing of, of um, like hypoxia and in and, and running out of oxygen. So, you know, it starts to like mess your head. You start hallucinating and stuff. That was one of the first things they talked about in the movie. You know, it was like the dangers of being at such a low depth, you know, of if you can't come, if you don't come back up in time. And they even talked about it again while she was in the tank with her sister before her sister like got killed and stuff by the shark that they were discussing it again. So it's like it's something that got set up twice before we saw the ending. So some people... You know, watching it, so I was like, "What? She imagined that? That's a horrible end." But no, it wasn't because they set it up twice before then. So we kind of saw that it was a possibility of her hallucinating. So then that sets up, oh, if she could hallucinate, then yes, that makes sense for her hallucinating this ending. It kind of infuriates the audience still because oh, I wanted her to survive and she's not gonna. <laughs> but oh it sets it up so the twist works. Did you see Strange but True with Margaret Qualley? I don't believe so. It was an adaptation. I think it came out last year. And that one 
was a shocker. And then when you write, when you go back, there were a few clues. Yeah. That I don't want to give what I mean, it's such a great film. Um, it, it was a, like a dark. Well, like, you know, the one that everyone keeps go, always goes to with the twist ending, you know, is, is uh, Sixth Sense. Okay. Like if you paid attention, you could find that you could figure out, you know, or if you didn't, even if you didn't figure out, if you rewind it, watch it a second time, you'll find all the different clues along the way that Bruce Willis is a ghost the whole time, you know. Um, there's it's a lot of like little minor things that you I didn't catch it the first time I watched it. Most people didn't. And people are like, what? That doesn't make sense. I rewatched it a second time. I'm like, oh, here's where it's set up for it. And here's where it's set up for it. And here's the here's two scenes in a row where it sets up for it. So <laughs> right. you know, it, it worked because there were setups. Like you don't you didn't realize it along the way, but then it's one of those things that like you look back on it and find out the movie is much better <laughs> than you actually realized it while you were watching it, sort of thing. Yeah. You like him, not Shyamalan? Oh yeah, I. I know a lot of people give him shit for I some of his why, movies. Yeah, I don't know why, but um, the only movie of his I didn't like was The Happening, uh, with the one where the trees are killing everyone. Okay. That was the only one that I thought was like too out there. Um, but like, I I'm a huge fan of his stuff. I I really want to see The Servant on. Apple TV Plus. I haven't gotten a chance to watch it yet. There's. I actually want to see most of the shows on Apple TV Plus. I'm just like itching to, <laughs> to to watch those. Um, Put it on the vision board. Yeah. Sure basically, another <laughs> what seven eight bucks a month or whatever it is. <laughs> no, but no, I, you're not vision, paying for this coffee. This vision board idea is getting expensive <laughs> now. All right. But you don't have the coffee expense. <laughs> right. Yeah. <and> that, <laughs> that adds up. So, so your book, 365, a year of screenwriting tips, yes. which is. Beautifully displayed uh, behind us, and then you also have a copy there. Now, I think you said, uh, first off, to begin, the purpose of the book is not to try and make you better at a specific thing. Right. Um, so a lot of screenwriting books will focus on one specific thing. You know, um, there's a book, uh, oh, what is it, Shadow something. Um, it's a very good book. I can't remember what it's called to plug it for him. Um, but it's it's all about characters. and. How to write characters specifically villainous characters. Oh. Um, then you have you know like Blake Snyder's you know Save the Cat that everyone loves and stuff that tells you like how to outline a story basically and like how story beats work. And then you have you know books that are like either like specifically about television writing. Oh. Stephen L. Sears, uh, prolific TV writer, he he uh, was the executive producer on Xena, Warrior Princess. He's got a, script, a book that's just about TV writing and, and it covers, you know, like how to come up with ideas and also some of the business stuff, which is why it's a very good book because it goes over the business stuff that a lot of other things skip and pass on. And so my book has like, it's not about a specific thing, it's kind of like a general overall arc of writing um, the process of writing, the business of writing, what you can expect. Um, you know, I've got it broken down into different parts. And if I can f get to the table of contents. So we've got like the before you start, which is, you know, talking about um, some of the misconceptions about writing in general. Uh, it talks about, you know, like, like I said before, about like the, the statistic that there are more NFL football players than there are screenwriters. Uh, then there's like a bit on writing and there's prep work, uh, which is you know about outlining and, and treatments and, and how to come up with ideas. Uh, there's a section on format. So instead of needing a whole book about format, you've got one section here that's what, 40-ish uh, pages on formatting. And each of, the, each of the things are only like a page or less each, you know, so um, it's all very quick reading. Um, there's a thing specifically on story, thing on character's dialogue, thing on rewriting, and then after what to do after the script is done. And, there is so it covers a little bit on everything, but it's not it's not made to make you a better writer. It's more of to know about the writing process, what to do before and after, um, how to get your head in game and come up with ideas and stuff like that. It also has ideas on how to relax. Um, you know, I've got in there one of the tips is about having a positivity calendar because it is very difficult to stay positive in this industry when you're getting rejections coming at you from everywhere. Um, so my positivity calendar is is. You get your calendar, instead of checking the calendar off with X's like they do in the movies, uh, I mark off the days on the calendar by writing every positive thing that happened to me that day. Oh, well, that's great. So then later on, if I have like a really bad rejection or like really wanting this meeting and then it fell through, instead of being like being glum, I can look back at the calendar and be, oh, well, okay, yes, today didn't, wasn't so great, but look at all this amazing stuff that happened to me earlier on in the week and stuff, you know. That's or, great and idea. yeah, it's a good way to keep, keep track of your progress. Like I also put in there like 
my pa what page I ended on on my different on my scripts each day, so then I can also keep track of my progress. I'm like, that's a positive thing. I, I got yesterday I was on page 23, today I'm on page 34. Awesome. I wrote you know a bunch of pages today. You know, and another tip in there is uh, relax. Go if you're in Los Angeles, go to Salt and Straw, get yourself some ice cream because it's fantastic ice cream. You know, where's um, that by the way? They have a bunch of locations. Oh, okay. um, they're originally from Oregon, I believe, um, and then they they've got uh, in Portland they've got like a couple locations. Then out here in LA they've got I think five locations in LA. There's one on Third Street in downtown. Uh, the only reason I don't suggest going there is there's nowhere to park. In the, yeah. in, in the arts district. Um, there's one on Larchmont. There's one on Ventura, uh, like up in, in, in NoHo area. Um, there's one in uh, Venice. Um, there's one on Santa Monica Boulevard. <laughs> uh, there's one uh, in um, downtown Disney now. Oh, nice. Just opened uh, last year, I think. And then they've got a couple locations. I think they've either one location or two locations down in San Diego. So like all along the West Coast, they've got Salt and Straw. And oh, San Francisco, they just opened a San Francisco one too. So basically everywhere <laughs> along okay. the West Coast. Uh, and it's fantastic ice cream. And they, they change their flavors every month. They, they have some really good ones. They have some really bizarre ones too. Like uh, in April, last April for the spring, I think they had one that had uh, chocolate covered bugs in it. Oh, wow. So it was a grass flavored ice okay. cream with chocolate covered bugs. Alrighty. Um, for Halloween, <laughs> they had a, a blood pudding one that the main base actually was chicken blood and livers. Ah, okay. and yeah, but then they also have, you know, like they, all, they have regular flavors oh, too. Good. Okay, do they have they like have, chunky monkeys? They have like <laughs> chocolate stuff, you know, and they have, um, like right now for February, they have, you know, a chocolatier series where all the flavors are based on like a local chocolatier company. Like if you're in LA, it's like all LA chocolate companies, um, you know, like like the Comparte and um, 31 Blackbirds and stuff like that where they make the ice cream based on those. San Diego, Portland, they all have like their own local chocolatiers that they change their, their recipes for. So uh, one year they had, um, I don't know why I'm talking about ice cream on so screenwriting. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm very hungry. By I'm the way. sorry. Um, uh, so, uh, 